Okay, we're just about ready if you want to wind things down. And uh, I'll, okay. Okay. Oh, Nance. Uh, and we're going to have Nancy. Do you want to come up here? Whoops. I want to lose your notes here. Oh, Nance. You're going to. So we're ready to start. We, uh, <clears throat> since uh, Seth, that's the reason you're seeing me a lot, is Seth is gone. Uh, so I decided to have uh, Nancy pray. I wanted to have the biggest height differential here I could find. So I picked Nancy to pray for <laughs> Pierce. So, so Nancy, if you'll be willing to pray for Pierce. Pierce will be. Yeah. I'll try not to knock over the microphone. <laughs> All right. Okay. Lord, I thank you for Pierce. We are telling him in the kitchen is I always, I always look forward to um, when he gives sermons. And Lord, I just pray that uh, for everybody sitting in this room, that you would help us to open our hearts to what he has to say and that we would hear what it is that you want us to hear. And not only God would we hear it, but we would go home and apply what it is that you want us to do and um, to accomplish with his words. And so thank you, Lord, for what he's going to talk about today. We praise your holy name, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, and um, it's always a great opportunity um, to be able to preach. Uh, of course, our, our pastor Seth is in Michigan, and so we're hoping that he's having a restorative time. Uh, the topic that I want to talk about is God's uh, waiting place and the idea of waiting. Um, there's a psalm here, Psalm 27, that, that gives us a sense that waiting on the Lord is a, a good thing. And that we're encouraged and asked and um, maybe compelled to pray to God about uh, the period we're in uh, as a period of waiting in certain ways. Um, this Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. And strength is an, a part of waiting. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about this idea, which I've uh, really been thinking about and exploring through um, the last couple months, actually, uh, in relation to time. And um, waiting in particular is sort of my focus. So um, this slide I have on the next page here is from a Dr. Seuss book. I have two toddlers, and uh, we read Dr. Seuss books, and one of those books is Other Places or Go. And in that book is a, a room called the waiting place. And here's the waiting place. There's people waiting for a, a car to go, a plane to fly, the fish to bite. They're waiting for it to rain. They're waiting for a better day. They're waiting. It goes on like that. And when I was reading this to my, my three and four-year-old child, uh, we do an improvisational thing where we're waiting for our hair to grow. We're waiting for the, the, the you, you know, the horse to gallop, the uh, you, you just can keep going like that for a while. And then the funniness started to get kind of serious after a while we read it, you know, they reread every night over and over. And um, I started thinking about what am I waiting for? And, um, you know, it, there's a lot of truth in children's books. And I think this idea of the waiting place is um, packed with a lot of application for adults. So what does it mean? Um, to be in something like uh, God's waiting place. When we're waiting, um, what, what is that like? What do we feel um, when we're waiting? I'm gonna put forward that waiting is a, place, a time of strengthening. It's a time of uh, preparation uh, for God to prepare us to handle what he has for us. Maybe that we're asking for, maybe we don't even know what's next and we feel like we're waiting, but we know uh, if we trust God that he is preparing us for what's beyond where we're right now. We're often in a rush to get there, but oftentimes God is not. And that's the waiting place when we're in a rush and God is not. Timing is everything. Uh, in the Bible, it's hard to know where to start. Ecclesiastes 3 is a, a popular one. Um, you know, it's a poem, a song, and a popular verse, right? There's a time for silence, there's a time for speech, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace, 
There's a time for love and hate. All of those um, feelings, emotions, actions um, have appropriate times. And sometimes we want to act a certain way, but God's calling us to behave a different way. Uh, our pastor um, spoke about um, Abraham waiting. We know that Abraham has a child when he's 100 years old, we're told in Genesis 21. But he's given a promise. How many years does he wait from that initial promise of seeing the stars like the children till Isaac is born? 25 years. He waits 25 years. And think about that period <laughs> and Hagar and Ishmael and how he, in some ways, is not a model for waiting, obviously. <laughs> uh, the patriarchs tend not to be. But Noah, Noah waited 120 years between when God said it will flood, you should build this boat. He started building. It took 120 years, according to the biblical account. Moses would lead the Israelites um, close to the promised land. Of course, he would not go in, but 40 years of time, there's wandering in the desert. David is anointed king, literally anointed, but Saul rejects that plan, right? And uh, tries to resist the rightful king. Jesus spent 30 years waiting in a carpenter shop. Uh, in the temple, we heard about uh, in our church service when he's 13. We know a little bit about what his parents do, but there's 30 years of essentially waiting from our perspective for his earthly ministry to really begin. I want to highlight how all of these examples that I've provided from Noah, Abraham, and so forth are ex exemplary uh, delays, not denials. And even Abraham is given a covenant promise that isn't fulfilled till generations after him. Um, and so that's a delay even beyond his life. It's bigger than that, right? And we're often given promises that, um, well, we want them to be fulfilled today <laughs> or soon. And we, we are a right to pray that. Now, there's nothing wrong with, um, with that prayer. But waiting, I, I feel like, becomes more and more important today um, with technology in particular, making things faster, uh, more expedient, uh, rapid, uh, just immediate. And the faster tech to the technology tends to be the more successful it is. And despite all those technological changes, um, God uh, is oftentimes not in a hurry. And uh, maybe the more rush that we're in, the more he might try to slow us down. And um, what I want to look at is some um, ideas with time. Like, what, what is it that comes to mind when you think about time? Um, where does your mind go in relation to God's time? You might think about Advent. Um, we just came out of Advent four weeks before Christmas. We count down. We prepare our hearts. We worship and, and, and maybe have time where we think about uh, the birth of Christ. Of course, Christmas is a time of renewed hope. Um, and we think about God being with us, that the wait is over, Emmanuel, right? There's a presence of God. Um, and, and yet, this is the birth of our Savior. Uh, we, we recount that story, and we talk about um, how he has arrived, and how he's completed and finished everything he set out to accomplish. Uh, so in terms of the kingdom, he's accomplished everything, but yet we're waiting for him to come in particular, if nothing else. Um, there's so many expressions with time. It's hard to know um, how much of that is influenced by our personal background or our culture, but we use expressions like um, time flies. We kill time. Time is of the essence, right? Uh, we have crunch time, high time, low time. Um, you know, all these senses of, of time often are not uh, aligned with uh, God's time, which might, in fact, be different. Um, what do you think about with time? I mean, philosophically, we might consider the beginning of time, how God created in the beginning from nothing. There's a beginning. Here we are, and there will be an end, we're told in Revelation, where the saints end that book by worshipfully proclaiming, come, 
Lord Jesus. And that is an a, a, a expression of devotion in our period of waiting. So I want to look at a couple passages to try to ground these insights and get us thinking about time and waiting in particular. Uh, the Psalms uh, will be the main passages and uh, a couple New Testament passages. And what becomes very clear um, and what I'm going to try to extract from a lot of these passages is a sense that what God has for you is not all for today. There's more to come. And um, we can't see these delays like denials. The way if I say to my child in an hour, that feels like never, right? We have to see that God might ask us to slow down and, uh, you know, wait for him. Uh, so the first passage um, comes from Abraham. Um, the first Psalm I want to look at here is from Psalm 13, verse one. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I felt like there couldn't be a, a more real Psalm <laughs> that cry. Uh, in our language, we might say, God, are you real? And, and where are you? Sometimes we feel forgotten, but God uh, does not forget us. We're told in, in many ways through many expressions that we are his beloved and that our hands are, are on his hands are our names written, it says in Isaiah. There's a sense in which God is uh, ever present in our lives and we have to uh, not feel forgotten and not doubt in a period of waiting uh, the delay, maybe the promise or even the word that God has given us. He has not and will not forget you. And the next passage uh, is um, a couple lines from Jesus who uh, is confronted with his disciples with questions about time and when is the time. And if you've read the New Testament, you start to see a repetition of Jesus saying, it's not my time. He knows the time, and he's calling us to um, reckon with God's time, I believe, in this uh, verse, where Jesus says to his disciples, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Well, that clarifies a lot. <laughs> there's, there's a sense in which Jesus, when speaking to his mother Mary, says, woman, it's not my time, right? He knows these things, and... Um, the father knows these things and we have to trust God. Um, we have to hope in our waiting. Um, and what does it look like when we wait patiently for the Lord? The next Psalm gives us a sense of that. Psalm 40 verses one through four say, I waited patiently for the Lord. We could almost stop there. Right, and I want, that's, that's the first part. And then the second part is everything that comes after that waiting. Like, what does that look like? And that, what, how can we characterize patient waiting on the Lord? So, he inclined to me and heard me cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. No matter what we're facing, no matter how dirty or ugly or evil or sinful, God can lift us out of that pit. No matter if you are waiting uh, or you feel like you're not, even if you're waiting, you can wait patiently, uh, confidently with intention and um, prayer. We're, when we're waiting, we're not always good. The way Abraham is not always good. Ab uh, David waits for the Lord. He turns back to the Lord. His heart returns to the Lord again and again. And in those moments in the Bible where I look at Abraham, I look at Moses, or I look at um, David or Moses, uh, they're not good in, in the perfect sense, obviously, as none of us are, 
but they're faithful, they're trusting, they're waiting, and I think that's what makes them so redeemable to me. And because look at this verse, where do people put their trust in? They put their trust in, in a lie and they're deceived. It, it suggests that people have a million other idols other than God to put their trust in. I mean, I was trying to imagine a, a, a way to categorize uh, how people put their trust in uh, things or people or uh, systems other than God. And the number, it's just too much to, to account. <laughs> And that's why I think of like idolatry, anything other than putting our faith in Jesus and God um, will not result in, in, in the way that uh, we pray and hope for. So um, the next um, couple of verses are all from Psalms. And I, I, I think I'm trying to capture uh, the qualities of what it means to wait patiently to be still, the first Psalm says, Psalm 37, verse seven, be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. I believe that I shall look upon goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I waited for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Here is an example of still, patient, quiet, trusting, steadfast, and courageous hope. And that last verse speaks of God's word. My soul waits, and in his word, I hope. All waiting has a sense of expectancy, intention, and purpose. This uh, next image, um, I asked Elizabeth to insert moments before, uh, because I think there's an image that comes to mind about a, a bus stop. And at a bus stop, Imagine you're there and you're waiting. What, if someone were observing you, how would you look? Um, how would you feel inside if, 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 if I could see your thoughts? If God could see your thoughts as you wait for him, how would you look at God's bus stop? You're waiting, what would you look like? Would you be staring at your phone? Would you be pacing, uh, looking at the schedule, calling a friend saying this bus isn't coming? <laughs> what would you do in that moment? When you know God's giving you a word, he's going to come. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> yeah, I'm calling, for, I'm saying a prayer to Jesus and that bus and what he's sending me will come my way. Right. And there is a time to wait. Maybe we're, we're there early. Maybe, you know, there's something that God has to do on our behalf. Maybe we need to grow in a certain way and come to a place of awareness and trust that we're not at right now in relation to what it is we're waiting for. There is a time of strengthening our faith, and oftentimes that time of strengthening is a time of waiting. Remember, God may delay our blessings without denying them. He may delay our blessings in order to garner greater, greater trust in him. Like Abraham, God may ask us to wait to test our faith, um, keeping in mind that even with Abraham, the covenant he implements doesn't come until generations later. So even if you don't have much time left, and what do we know about tomorrow? Um, we should put our trust immediately in God and know that in that period of waiting, that one day, maybe like a thousand years, time works differently for God. I don't quite know what that verse means, but it does suggest that God's time is different from my time. Waiting is an active spiritual process, not one of abandonment and lost feelings of uh, being alone, but rather trust. It's, a, it's an opportunity to turn to God and to ask what he wants us to do in this period of waiting. We have hope. That hope is, is Jesus. And I, I just pray that... Um, 
this message reaches you and allows you to wait with more confidence in the coming of our Lord. Amen. Jesus, uh, thank you for this um, opportunity to, to speak and to share your message of confident hope in this uh, day after Christmas, this day after we celebrate your birth. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the gift of your spirit that lives inside of us and will remain until the end. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Now is our time of communion, and I do have a brief uh, communion devotional I'd like to share. And it's about uh, two fishermen, uh, real people, uh, brothers Moshe and, uh, and Yuval Lufan, and they were walking along the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee in Israel. And um, they were amateur ar archaeologists, and they were trudging with their eyes down on the ground looking for anything. And because it was 1986, and there had been a drought that year, and the Sea of Galilee had actually lowered the, the level. And so they were kind of hoping, okay, let's see what the lake uncovers as, as, the, the, it, uh, uh, as the water lowered. And the brothers stumbled across the oval shape of what appeared to be a boat sunken in the mud right along the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And so they were really excited. They were amateurs, so they called in the professionals and they started to dig around this and they really made one of the greatest archeological finds in Israel's history because they found an intact fishing boat. And it was the same kind of boat that would have been used by Jesus and his disciples. And in fact, they did radiocarbon dating on that boat and found that it was used around the time of Jesus, give or take about 80 years, depending, it's not real exact. So it was a pretty exciting thing. And so they, they had to excavate very carefully this boat. Uh, and um, on the first day of the excavation, uh, it was what was kind of amazing is that there was a sudden gas downpour, but it only lasted about a few minutes and it created a perfect double rainbow across the Sea of Galilee. And so one of the excavators was said, this is a sign, it's gotta be a sign from God, a blessing on the discovery. And so for 11 days, they carefully uncovered the very fragile boat, about 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and 4.3 feet high. So back in Jesus' day, you would have had uh, maybe four people might have rowed the boat, but they also had one, one sail, a single sail. So, but the question was how to move this fragile boat so without it crumbling to pieces. So what they did is they encased the entire wooden structure in a coat of polyurethane, and then they floated the boat uh, away. And uh, when the boat was floating away, one of the uh, workers, uh, it was encased in polyurethane, uh, stretched out on the top. So that was the first person who actually took the sail in that boat in 2000 years. So uh, when Nancy and I went uh, with the seminary trip to Israel, we got to see this boat, which is beautifully preserved in a museum right along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And along the walls, they have all kinds of illustrations and information about the boat. But one thing that really caught my eye, and this was an illustration that talked about the 12 types of wood that were used to build what they now call the Jesus boat. And um, two of those woods came from trees that had very startling names to me. One was called Christ Thorn, and it's a spiky wood that, according to tradition at least, it was the wood that was used to create the crown of thorns on Jesus' head. Another type of wood came from the Judas tree. And that has, that legend says that this is the tree that Judas hanged himself on after betraying Jesus. So we got the Christ thorn and the Judas tree were two of the 12 woods that were used to create this boat. And so to me, um, you know, so you've got one wood, uh, well, both of them are really connected to pain and suffering. Uh, the thorns, of course, are physical pain, and the betrayal of Judas was an emotional pain. And so, but to me, that's, uh, this boat is really a symbol of the strength of the kingdom of God, because, you know, the boat has Christ's thorn and Judas tree uh, built right into its fabric, yet it still survived all these years, 2,000 years. And I think it's the same thing with the kingdom of God, you know, no matter what forces are against us, that the kingdom of God is going to continue to survive and, and, uh, and, and we will persist. And, uh, you know, Judas and the crucifixion couldn't stop the kingdom. I don't think there's anything that could. And I think the boat's also a parable of our individual lives. It tells me that we too can survive in the midst of these kind of trials, as long as we're on board uh, with Jesus. And uh, I think he's gonna 
he'll make our life seaworthy. I mean, they've all, you know, we may feel like there's leaks springing up all over the place, but he'll be with us. Um, there is no such thing as a perfect world. Uh, I believe that utopia is actually means no place because there is no place that has the utopia. Um, and so, but so Jesus is working with a very imperfect church, as we all know. You know, we've got imperfect, bickering, bumbling people like us. And, and from the very beginning of the ministry, he's been trying to unite us. Uh, he started with the bickering Jews and Gentiles in the New Testament, where he tried to break down the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And it continues to this day in the church. And, um, you know, Paul goes on to say his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And so, again, the, the goal today is still the same, to tear down the dividing walls. And to me, <clears throat> the communion table is a place where we can go and be unified, where this dividing wall can come down. It's, it's, and, I, and I like to kind of think that when we're going up that small little table, we're kind of squeezing into a little boat. And because it's, uh, uh, it's you know, the, the communion, uh, is, it, it's the place where we recognize what did save us. It was Jesus' sacrifice that saved us. And, and, uh, and we're getting into the boat with him and we're, we're recognizing that sacrifice that he made for us. And so um, when, you know, when the rains begin to fall, you know, we might feel that our boat's gonna capsize, but we are safe because Jesus is in that boat with us. And so when we go to communion, remember that he is with us in that boat. And, um, and so if you're in a relationship with Jesus, you're welcome to come and partake of the commun uh, communion table because that is a place of safety. That's a place of safety in the storm. So let me read from Luke and then we can go up and share at the table. This is Luke 22, 14 through 20. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again the, of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Amen. 